Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 20. This week on the show, my guest is Hannah Stevenson. Hannah is a poet, writer, editor, and instructor living in Columbus, Ohio. Her work has appeared in publications like The Atlantic, 32 Poems, Sixth Finch, Poetry Daily, and many others. And she's also the founder of Paging Columbus, which is a monthly literary arts event held in Columbus. Now, I first started following Hannah's work through her blog, The Storialist, where she regularly posts either her own poetry or she shares poems and artwork from others. Now, there's a lot of things that I like about Hannah's poetry. I like the specificity of imagery. I like the way the poems often balance right on the edge of wistfulness and playfulness in tone. But I think what really drew me in is how so many of her poems really invite you to read them carefully, to spend time with them. Often what she posts to her blog is completely without punctuation, with only the capitalization left as markers of where the sentence breaks ought to be, and that creates a certain ambiguity that lets different messages, different meanings come out when you read the lines in different ways. And having spent some time with these poems, what I come away with is a sense of a deeply inquisitive mind. Uh, recently, I took the opportunity to buy a copy of her book, which is called In the Kettle, the Shriek, which was published in 2013 by Gold Wake Press. And I'm so glad I did, because everything I liked about the poetry I knew from her blog is there. It's sometimes pensive, sometimes funny, sometimes pointed, but it all invites you to take that second or third or fourth reading you can get a copy of her book for yourself directly from her, which I highly recommend, and I put a link in the show notes to the book page on her site. Anyway, it's that book that we talked about today, mostly, so you'll hear more in just a second. I do want to note, just before we get started, uh, that due to scheduling constraints, we didn't have time for a second segment this time around, so the episode is a little shorter than usual, but I think we covered a lot and we had a really great talk, so have a listen. Here's my conversation with Hannah Stevenson. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk to you. You're you are the first uh, the first poet that I will be talking to for that's the so show. Cool. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah, I love your. I love all the folks you've featured. I looked through some of them and I thought, oh, this is so cool. And I haven't done an interview or anything in a really long time, so I was really looking forward to it. Yeah. So, um, so I just finished reading your book uh, in the kettle, the shriek. I've just finished awesome. reading it last night. Um, Great. And I really enjoyed it. Um, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm not quite sure there where where to start. There was so many yeah. things. I actually ended up writing a whole bunch of notes as I was going. I like to, especially awesome. with poetry, I end up doing that a lot. Um, one of the things that I noticed about it uh, was that a lot of the poems, it seemed like, it seemed to me like you have this this way of having like a a turn in sort mm -hmm. of the middle middle or late part of the poem where it starts off seeming like it, uh, it one thing and then it turns into something else. Yeah. And I thought that was just really interesting. And then it's funny because I, as I was um, as I was because uh, I, I had tweeted you uh, yesterday, I think as I, I was only about halfway through it, and I wasn't yeah. sure I was going to be able to finish it in time. And I'm really glad it did because it seemed to me like actually the collection as a whole at, also had a turn about two thirds of the way oh, wow. through, um, where well, it sort thanks. of started off feeling one way and then ended up feeling a different way. Interesting. I love hearing what people think about that kind of thing. It's so interesting to hear from a reader's perspective and a careful reader. Um, that's so interesting. Um, what did? Where did you see a? Did you see a certain poem that that made a turn for you? Or well, like in terms of the in terms of the collection as a whole, I think yeah. the turn sort of starts around first cavity maybe or maybe a little mm, bit before interesting. that interesting yeah I'm, back to, I'm looking at my own book i'm looking at my own table of contents to mm -hmm. see <laughs> where that is fun okay so that's on 60 yeah that would be about two-thirds yeah cool yeah mm -hmm. um what, what i was noticing that 
I thought was very interesting as I was reading it because I, I've been trying to read more poetry lately, especially more contemporary poetry. And, um, and it seems like everybody obviously has their own way of working and their own process. The thing yeah. that I was really noticing about these poems is that especially in the beginning part of the collection, they don't, they don't feel quite as declarative, I suppose, as mm. some other people's poetry does. Like I, what I've, I've, I've noticed um, often in my own poetry or in other people's poetry that I'm drawn to that that it has a certain sense of being like, this is how it is, or at least this is yes. how it is for me. And many mm -hmm. of the poems that are in this collection are are sort of more asking a question like, how is it or, or what is it or, you know, mm -hmm. rather than definitely rather than just saying this is how it is. Um, Extremely. Yeah. But then as sort of as as you move towards the later part of the the later poems there there seems to be more less questioning and more um a little bit more um statement maybe i don't know oh i love that i love that idea that's so interesting to me <laughs> thank you i really appreciate your response to that and i mean like when i arranged the book it was really um, I guess it was really intuitive, but it also was deliberate, of course. Mm -hmm. And I, it's funny that you said, you know, the word turn. And I really, I thought of this book as having like two, two halves kind of, mm -hmm. um, and having sort of a hinge in the middle almost. And in my head, the way I thought of it was the first half is sort of things coming together and then I did I did feel that there was a turn at some point and then it became things coming apart um but I really like what you're saying that in this like things coming apart section it seems not like hmm, not um questioning or not not like chaos things coming apart it doesn't equal chaos um it equals sort of I don't know. So there's like a firmness if that makes, I don't know if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. <laughs> a firmness yeah. in the way things uncoil or the way things come apart. And I always find it really reassuring that things break down, which sounds really backward, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's the truth. It's the ultimate truth. Right. right. <laughs> so, and, and I also think it's interesting what you said about questions be and um, declaration because um, I don't know what happened, but all the question marks just went away when I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. And that's continued into my poems now. And a lot of um, punctuation marks have gone away, which is yeah. so weird because I'm also like a copy editor and um, college instructor. So I'm like, you know, I love punctuation mm -hmm. <laughs> and grammatical soundness. So I, I don't, I'm not sure there's something psychological for me in question marks and you know the idea that removing them a question can sort of become a statement and a question at the same time yeah so i don't if that i don't know if that makes any sense it um, completely but I, does there was there were several yeah. points where um and i wish i had written down a specific one but there were several points where i was noticing that you would end a question with a period and it and it really worked in two ways um, and I thought that was a very interesting choice. And actually, it was, it's something that, um, cause I first came to your poetry through your blog and I, I was trying to think of who introduced me to it. And I can't. I was really wondering. I know, like, I, I remember meeting you on Twitter and just thinking, like, I was so heartened that people love reading poetry. You know, I'm so heartened when there, people love giving careful readings mm -hmm. <laughs> and are sen sensitive, astute readers. So, um, I just remember being like, oh, this is so awesome. This like really cool artistic photographer writer uh, is following me. So I, I wonder, I wonder who it was. Yeah, I, can, uh, I cannot I for the life of me remember who it was. Um, which the internet is, is webby. It is. It's, it's worldwide webby. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it did strike me because uh, that was one of the things that I had noticed a lot about your poetry was uh, the stuff that you were posting on your blog at that time and still. Um, uh, the lack of punctuation marks, um, and how that was something that, um, for me, you know, I don't have a lot of formal education in poetry, so it's more just been what I've, what I've been able to find on my own. And yeah. for me, 
you know, reading your poetry really opened up a whole new possibility in terms of being able to, by leaving out the punctuation marks, um, to enable multiple readings of the same lines. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And I don't know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think there's a, some people think poetry is very confessional. Like mm-hmm. it's this really highly personal, intimate, intense outpouring of emotion. And for me, it is very intense and very charged but it's also really, really slippery. And like every poet I know, we're all like really slippery fish in some ways that we, we like to be a little bit ambiguous. And I think we have a specific meaning in our minds, but um, we're saying multiple, we like saying multiple things mm-hmm. at once. And we like, we don't always like to reveal to the reader, you know, who we're speaking to or what we mean. And we like being a little coy that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think much more than fiction writers, um, certainly at least, and perhaps more than nonfiction writers. So it's, it's, it is a strange quality of poetry. I think that not, I mean, most poems have several readings available to us, Mm -hmm. but um, I guess I know for me personally, I really enjoy that, (laughs) that sort of slippage between what I'm saying and what I seem to be saying. And I love to let the reader feel that disconnect, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, uh, reading your poetry in before and then reading through this book, there, there's, um, there's a lot of subtlety, you know, and it's one of the things that I find really interesting thinking about poetry as an art form. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for my day job, I'm an engineer. And so I have sort of a, a oh, that's certain, so cool. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> it has its moments, but <laughs> admirable, admirable, and so different. I mean, so seemingly different it than is, I think it's, the arts. Yeah, but I have a certain tendency to try to take things apart and see how they work. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and and it's it the there there the way that different people approach. Um, poetry and how they write it. Um, you mentioned the, the the confessional aspect, and and certainly, you know, for me, that's that's a, a thing when I'm when I'm writing poems is often uh, has that aspect to it. But the way that people phrase things, mm-hmm. um, how some people tend to just come right out and say things, and yes. some people sort of are, have that sort of more coy quality that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me like your your poetry I wouldn't have said coy exactly, but just that that there's a subtlety to it where things often are um suggestive more than um overt. Yeah. Thank you. I that's that is a very good thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, the, and I appreciate that. Yeah. The one that I was um particularly drawn in by last night when I was reading was this poem Pleasing. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, I mean, part of it was just that, you know, it's sort of serendipitously uh, touched on some things that I've been thinking about already. Uh, but, yeah. but one of the things about that poem is, so it's, it's about, well, I'm just flipping to it now, page 45. Here, Me too. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's fun in our hymnals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's... It, it starts off with these these four lines here. Let me be more of what you want. I mean, let me be more of what you want, please. And to me, that has a certain feeling to it. As you, then you move through the rest of the poem, the the there are all of these sort of um, um, it's almost a uh, gosh, I can't think of the right word. I'm 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 really failing myself right now. No, you're fine. You're fine. But poetry is challenging <laughs> to <yeah>. talk about. <laughs> there's so it's all of these things that that are saying, you know, I can do this for you. Let me do these things for you. And there's a sort of seductive quality to this in so far as like this, the, what's being described, this sort of supplication is mm-hmm. very comfortable to me. But those mm-hmm. first four lines to me sort of suggest almost a loss of self that that sort of Mm. puts into question the whole rest of the poem and i thought you know when i was talking about your poems having a turn before this one was almost that backwards where as you move into the poem it it 
it has this very familiar and comforting, like romantic quality. But those first four lines I keep coming back to and saying, like, is it, is it, is it good for these things to to be romantic and comforting? I don't know. That's really fascinating. And like with a lot of these poems, I can remember exactly like the feeling of starting them or the way into the poem and the way into every poem isn't always the first line for me. Mm-hmm. And some writers may, maybe they always start with the first line and I don't, it depends. Sometimes I think of the title, sometimes, sometimes it is the first line, but for me it is, it was this opening, but it was also, I had just got, like, I remember it was a really hot day. It was the summer I had gone to the grocery store. So that's where all that grocery stuff was coming in. And, um, I don't know, I guess thinking of the idea of, like it's called pleasing and I think about being a people pleaser and being Mm -hmm. an artist and I like what you say about loss of self and I do think a lot of these poems like they kind of have that disembodied self or disembodied voice and um it's it's been weird like in my more recent poems some I'm writing a lot about you know I have a, a baby son he's seven months old and I find I'm, He's adorable I'm writing, too, by the way. Well, thanks. Thanks. He is adorable. He, I think so too. Thanks. His name is Henson. <laughs> and I'm writing a lot to him directly. And, um, and also, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm writing from my, from my own embodied self a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And here with a lot of these poems, like I, I did feel like this, almost aerial quality where I was like hovering sort of astral projection quality while I was writing a lot of these pieces. And, um, I do think like that urge, there's that, that urge to sort of fix or that urge to heal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of artists have it and I guess it can be at an expense. So I think, I don't know. I really find it fascinating that you pointed that out. And I mean, that's what the poem is about ultimately um, you know, your own body healing, but, um, I don't know, I guess it's so weird when I write these because you, the you of poems, it's so, is very, very slippery. Like sometimes it's to myself. Sometimes it's, you know, a multitude of unknown readers. Sometimes it's just this idealized reader in my mind, or maybe sometimes it's even a a person that I'm sort of thinking of. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, it, it, maybe there's a, a sort of twinned impulse in, you know, relationships or um, friendships or any type of back and forth. There's that, you know, person giving and per- person receiving. And um, I, I do think it's, it can be very healthy, but it can be very um, damaging too. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, maybe I, I, I don't mind the, the sort of danger here in that poem. I don't, I don't think it's only... It's, it's easy to read this poem, I think, as, and a lot of my poems, it's easy to read them as, like, very happy. And I don't, I think that that's not all that is there, for sure. Um, but, so I appreciate you seeing that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, I think that's an interesting point, because, you know, when I was, when I was reading these um, poems, and um, there's something in, in there about the, the, the use of you that I would like to get back to, but just, just in terms of how your poems feel... Mm -hmm. Um, this is actually always something that I'm a little, um, hesitant about sometimes because you, you don't, you don't want to ascribe too much. I try to infer too much about the artist from the art, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Right. But what I did feel from the, the poems themselves, at least was that, you know, they're not happy exactly, but that they don't seem to have quite the same sense of um, like when, when you talk about decay or things falling apart, which is a major theme in the latter half of the book, that Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to have quite the same sense of anxiety or panic that people often have when they're writing about that. And in other points where you're talking about certain social things that you might be critiquing, like in, um, in little black dress, I, 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 I pulled out this little quote that just really knocked me out. It was, uh, um, when they catch her, they will spill shame over her head as sweetly as parents bathing a little baby. It was just Mm -hmm. that, that line just really, it, it, it so perfectly cuts that feeling. Um, but 
at the same time, there is a sweetness to it where that this 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 poem has a certain critique to it of yes. of of women's um, portrayal in society, and and it's certainly Definitely. like an important critique, but it doesn't have it doesn't feel angry either. Does that make sense? No. It does. It makes total sense. And it's interesting because I, I did, and I definitely didn't feel any anger while writing it, nor did I feel the one before it is um, somewhat similar. It's we will judge you based on your wedding. Yeah. And to me, these are, they're like very linked in my mind. And um, it is, I, I guess it's me sort of doing like, I don't know, psychoanalyzing an impulse and also psychoanalyzing the voice that comes through, like this prescriptive voice that comes through the rhetoric of, you know, fashion magazines or reality shows. Like, and I guess where I, that disembodied voice quality of a lot of these poems, because maybe they're, I'm playing with found phrases or found cadence more likely. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, I'm a real like cadence junkie. I love hearing the way that other people phrase things. And I, I always have an ear for it, and I love hearing accents and um, trying to pick up on the subtleties of other people's language. And Little Black Dress is, I mean, it is true. Everyone, I mean, it's LBD, quote-unquote. People mm -hmm. abbreviate it so much. And I think about how, um, I don't know, how psychologically rich it is that women are prescribed that. And I had, I had just read that book, um, a little book on the human shadow. Do you know that book? I don't. By uh, Robert Bly, who is a poet, but it's about, um, you know, Jungian psychology and about the concept of the shadow self. And it's, I mean, it's really, really interesting book. I think you'd really like it. Um, but I was just thinking about uh, fashion and the voices that, that command us to do things that kind of come from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And to me, I guess it's not, like, I do I feel angry about it in society? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm, you know, obviously a feminist and, you know, will definitely, like, take up arms against it. But I don't know. The, the poem, I feel, is much more playful, mm -hmm. like you're saying, and sort of playing or unspooling that weird cadence and trying to sort of think about what makes it tick. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely... Um, that was something I wrote in my notes for "We Will Judge You Based on Your Wedding." That there's, that that it that it it is a critique, but there's a certain laughter to it as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. And I I think to me those things go hand in hand. Like I I love writing poems where there's a joke, and then there's also something kind of sad or melancholy or odd. And I think um, there's a lot of there's a lot of commonalities between jokes and poems mm -hmm. and it's the most absurd, the most absurd comedians I always think are so poetic mm -hmm. <laughs> and stand up. I mean, feels sometimes like a poetry reading. Some of it does at least. And I think about the idea of a punchline and I think that sometimes poems are just maybe they're jokes without punchlines in some way or, Sometimes they're just a punchline, and then they kind of go in reverse. But I do think there is a there's a relation between poetry and comedy hmm. that is um, like maybe it's absurdity is the thing, like remarking on absurdity. That's mm -hmm. the link. Yeah, for me at least, it is one of them. Yeah, I mean, and both both definitely involve um, uh, a certain you know they require a certain observation. Uh, powers of observation, mm -hmm. and both of them tend to be very specific in language. Um, yes. So, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and I think also is um, maybe this kind of gets back to something you were saying earlier um, about the poem pleasing, but I think a lot of poems, I think of them as performative, even on the page, mm -hmm. and they really, they really require the reader's participation um, and... Maybe that's why not everyone, you know, loves poetry. And um, that's a whole other can of worms, I think. Not everyone loves poetry because it's done a disservice in education. You know, we don't mm -hmm. get to approach it. We don't get to all approach it in the best way. Um, but I, I think that it really does require, like, a high level of participation from the reader, maybe much like someone attending a comedy show. Hmm. And it um, can be uncomfortable. And I think about, 
I used to always think about reaching through the page and talking to that reader. And I used, I had a poem called the two way mirror that was sort of about this. And mm. I'm often, I'm mostly writing on my laptop. Well, I used to mostly write on my laptop. Now I'm writing on my phone <laughs> <laughs> while I'm nursing my son or holding my son. But, um, I always thought about it like, oh, it's so weird. I'm like writing into this window and looking into it. And it's almost like someone's on the other side of it reading as I'm, as I'm about to publish it. So I, I, I think maybe, um, even on the page, there's that quality mm-hmm. that, um, the reader is like right there. It's like very close in these poems to me, at least. Yeah. You even had, there was a poem in here about pretty much that was about that. I think it was called telepathy. Yeah. Yeah. There's mm-hmm, right here. Yeah. Yeah. And it that that is really interesting. Um it, there's a sort of uh, uh magic to um to writing in general I feel like but in but in particular with poetry um because poetry is has sort of the less concrete feeling than prose. Um I mean it doesn't have to but often it, it does. Uh yeah. it it really seems to to be this sort of mental connection over time and space. That, yeah, I don't know. I just find that fascinating. I like that too, and I think about it as um, I once called it like an experience um, experiment, mm-hmm. or it's kind of like an experiment in trying on someone else's consciousness or someone else's eyes or brain or something. Like art is maybe you know visual art or a painting. It's here, try on the way I look, try on the way I see, and the way I process, mm-hmm. and. Um, I, you know, poetry is the same and, you know, try on the way my brain sounds when I see something, <laughs> Yeah, which is creepy, but really fun. <laughs> yeah. It actually gets um, back to something that I, 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 that I wanted to talk about the thing that yeah. you were saying about, about you, the way you use the word you and just in general about sort of authorial voice um, that what I, I remember I read this, um, I think it was just a series of tweets that um, uh, I can't remember who who it was, but was talking about how everybody was talking about Beyonce's Lemonade, and mm-hmm. and how in um, in fiction, in in prose fiction, pe- people have no trouble uh, distinguishing between um, persona and author when the author writes yeah. in the first person, but with mm-hmm. with songs and with poetry people have a really hard time and i just thought that was really so true i thought that was a really interesting observation especially considering that i feel like in 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 music and poetry particularly that that's almost intentional a a lot of times you know yeah because so Mm -hmm. many people do write confessionally Um, sure yeah and it's more i don't know if it's more it's more vulnerable in a way Mm -hmm. um it's more more charged because it's shorter. <laughs> like it takes up less space than a novel, let's say, mm-hmm. where you have like a few hundred pages. If you only have, you know, a couple pages for a poem, uh, not that you couldn't take hundreds and hundreds of pages, but sure. everything's so condensed and there's so much um, unspokenness and so much sort of white space in there. And maybe fictional prose sort of has less space in it. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas, and that's interesting to think about. So, like, all that space, maybe, I don't know, there has to be something like a psychological projection thing that's happening, <laughs> mm-hmm. I think. Um, but I, I definitely agree with you. Um, I've had people ask me things like, is this poem true? And it's always funny because it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> all poems are, are true. Things they can have happened. Mm-hmm. Have they happened exactly the way they seem to? Mostly, but I think poets are very, very aware that true is, and, you know, fiction and nonfiction are so messily intertwined. Mm-hmm. And I, maybe it's also um, that poetry creates, and song create this really specific like cadence and rhythm and they sort of invent a world for you to absorb thoughts in if that makes sense and it seems more i don't know this sounds really weird new agey spacey (laughs) but um it it invents like it invents its space for you to take it in 
Whereas with fiction, for me, it also does the same thing, but it takes a lot longer to discover that. Whereas poetry, like, throws you into a room or a song, throws you into a room or a space, and it's like, here, here, you know, immediately feel these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Wow, I wish that we could keep talking, but I know you have to get going, so... It's okay, I still have about five minutes or so, if that works for you. Does that sound good? Yeah, I, <laughs> we I'm, could keep going. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's an int- It's just such an interesting thing because, um, um, you know, I, I, I think that what often people get wrapped up in is the difference between um, truth and fact. Um, yeah. And what mm-hmm. we're really reaching for is is a sense of authenticity. Um, mm-hmm. That you know, poems and songs are so often. Um, uh, much more emotionally charged than other, um, uh, and more emotionally immediate than other art forms. That's right. That's right. Um, and so they can have this very profound and immediate effect on the audience that you, mm-hmm. as an audience member, you want to have that, um, that experience be authentic, but then what authentic means in that context is kind of tricky. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I really want, I think as a writer, you know, on the other side of the screen, I'm always thinking, I am thinking about authenticity because I do seek that in people's work. Like I want, I want to read poetry or hear music that sounds so sure of itself that it couldn't be any other way than how it is and that it creates its own footing. And um, I don't know, I guess I, I do hope to do that as a writer as well, that it's, that it's believable. Like there's nothing worse than feeling the gimmick of a poem or feeling, feeling the tryingness mm-hmm. of a writer. And I, you know, I can sense it when I'm going, when I'm doing it in my own writing, when I edit my own stuff, I know that's the, the piece I always need to get rid of. If I'm like se- trying to do something, that's always gonna be bad. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is, that is definitely the, and it's often when I'm trying to work through a poem, it's those lines that are, um, that are trying too hard and you know, they're trying too hard, mm-hmm. but you also mm-hmm. can't quite figure out how to get to the place yeah. where you want to go without it. That's, that's yep. the challenge for me all the time. And for me, it's always, um, like the line I always think of for myself is like, I need to like, I need to be braver. Like a poem needs to be braver. When I edit my poems, I'm often editing my own work. My, I'm often editing for bravery and I think whenever I'm, for me, it's like comes across as sounding tentative and it, there's this sense of like covering up or like in trying to say something a nice way or trying to phrase it in a way that makes sense mm-hmm. and not taking, not taking enough of the risk mm. to be more, you know, either bold or to be more weird or shocking or more open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. What were you going to say? <laughs> Just yeah. for me, I often find that that the where my poems tend to fail is because I'm being a little too explicit, and like I'll ah. try to spell things out for people that should be le- without letting mm-hmm. them come to it on their own. Yeah, um, trusting the I, audience. I know that. That's right. That's a hard thing to do. That is. I think it's maybe it's always come down to trusting the reader and mm. trusting yourself to you know, to guide that reader or that you're going to be able to give them the right kind of path for something. Mm -hmm. But that is, that's tricky. (laughs) I think as long as you know those things about yourself, then you sort of know your little ticks that you can look for. Mm -hmm. When at least that's what I, for my own work, that's something I know that those are ticks I can look for. And even in figuring out what to exclude from this collection, anything that didn't feel like it was doing that most openly. Mm-hmm. I was like, no, I don't want to. Anything that felt too tentative, I ended up taking out. Mm-hmm. So, which is, I don't know, it's a very good lesson. It's a good lesson in, in trusting the self, really. Right. Well, I mean, uh, all I can say is that uh, I definitely would give this, uh, this book my, my full recommendation. And um, I'm going to throw a link into the show notes so that people can know where to find it. Um, I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to read it. Um, so, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm thanks so glad you enjoyed it. it. 
Yeah, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And um, I don't know, you and I, I know we mostly have spoken on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to mention to to people that there is a poem inspired by a tweet uh, by Jimmy Kimmel. And uh, you never know that, I guess I think that's, that social media and um, it's so, it's so helpful at connecting people. And it's such a great place to find community, but it, it's amazing that it gives inspiration too. So just to sort of, I don't know, give a little bit of like a yay to Twitter, which people always are hating on and yeah. saying is very selfish. I really, I really find it so helpful as an artist. Me too. It's, Me too. Yeah. Just as a human, actually, a number of like, yeah. really meaningful conversations I've had on Twitter uh, is pretty astonishing. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually coming back around, like I can't remember who introduced me to you, but you personally have introduced me to any number of, uh, really interesting other poets and writers and artists. And I certainly have to thank you for that. Oh, well, my pleasure. I'm, I'm really happy to do that. And if you ever need recommendations of people, that's one of my, one of my favorite things. I think all artists have that duty. Mm-hmm. I know you do that in your work with visual arts too, of recommending people. I try but to. it's our duty. We have, yeah, I think it's our artistic duty. We have to be good citizens that way. And I don't know, connect people and link people to other work. That's amazing. Cause there's so much, so much good stuff out there. Yeah. Um, that it's, that it's hard to, hard to navigate, I think sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people find you if they want to find more? About uh, you, you can, can find me on my site, the storialist and, um, that's www dot the storialist S T O R I A L I S T dot com. Um, you can find me there and, um, I've been posting sort of newer work that's sort of fragmented. So I hope people enjoy that. Uh, and I also have a couple of, um, anthology editing projects in the work, uh, in the works. One of my, one of them right now is um, New Poetry from the Midwest, which is published by New American Press. Um, so that will be out hopefully by the end of this year, maybe next year. But um, if, if you're also looking for other poets, other contemporary poets, um, that would be a fun thing to for people to check out. Great. Well, I will definitely check that out. Awesome. Um, yeah. This is yeah. so fun today, Mike. Oh, Maybe great. we'll get to do a part. We'll get to do a part two at some point in the future. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Well, thanks so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, that was my talk with Hannah Stevenson. As I mentioned at the top of the show, I've put a link in the show notes if you'd like to buy a copy of her book. It's really great. I definitely recommend it. I've also included a link for the anthology she mentioned, New Poetry from the Midwest, the 2016 version. Uh, So you can order that when it comes out. You can also order previous versions of that anthology from the publisher. And also I've included a link to where you can follow her on Twitter at The Storyalist. That just about does it for this week. If you have any questions about today's episode or about anything at all, really, you can email me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. You can also follow me and the show on Twitter at Channel Open Pod or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Keep the Channel Open. And I'm always happy to chat with listeners either of those places. If you haven't done so already, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. That's the best way to support the show for now. And if you like what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe wherever you prefer to get your podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Next time, we will be talking with photographer Kurt Simonson, so be sure to come back for that. And in the meantime, remember, keep the channel open. (laughs) ¶¶